in the mid-1980s in the face of what the black and Latino community saw as an escalation of police misconduct leading to violence and even killings, a group of attorneys, pastors, and politicians got together to found the Center for Law and Social Justice. And the center housed at Medgar Evers College turns 30 this year. And we want to welcome its general counsel, Lurie Daniel Favors. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate Thank you for it. the work you do every day. It's our pleasure. Some of our favorite guests on this show happen to filter through the Center for Law and <laughs> Social Justice at Medgar true. Evers College. Mm, it's a, a very good, good friend to of BK Live. Yeah. So, Lurie, can you tell us a little bit about the original mission of the center sure. and how that mission has sort of morphed and changed in, in three decades? So, as you mentioned, the center was started in 1986, and it was really in response to a lot of the uh, really constant reports of police brutality that were resulting in extreme violence against members of the black and brown community and that were ultimately leading to death of unarmed citizens. Um, and that auspicious beginning um, has really helped to steer the center in the 30 years since. And so the center has been involved in everything from uh, being a part of the creation of the uh, CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Um, they were at the forefront of working to uh, pursue the special prosecutor in cases where there are unarmed civilians who are um, murdered by members of the police force. Um, and so really have done a number of uh, engaged in a lot of advocacy and a lot of litigation around these issues. They've done a lot of work with voting rights, especially now. You're going to see a lot more of that happening because this is a huge election year. Um, and it's the first time that we're going to be voting without the protections of Section 5 under yeah. the Voting Rights Act. So we're literally going to be participating in voting and the enfranchisement of our community with less protections than many of our grandparents had. And so that's something that is really at the front and center of what the center has been doing. Um, and with that, it also uh, includes a lot of work on the areas of educational equity, looking not just at whether or not black and brown children have access to education, but what's the quality of that access. So once they're in schools, are they receiving a culturally competent education, one that takes their history and their culture in mind? Um, and so that really frames out a lot of the, the past work that we've been doing. Um, as you may be aware, we've had a lot of activity over the past few months, a number of forums and uh, events for the community, which is really a part of our community outreach and education platform. Um, really want to make sure that black New Yorkers and New Yorkers of color and those from disenfranchised communities have as much access to information as possible about protecting their rights in a wide variety. Now, for the monthly forums that the center holds, how do you come up with the ideas behind those forums, and how well have they been attended? Because we were talking a little earlier, yeah. and you said, like, it's every month, it's just people are just coming it's in the door. Like how that. do you reach yes. out? Yes. Um, so we've had, over the past few months, quite a few uh, forums and events that are open and available to the community, and they were offered free of charge, because we really do want to have a platform for that. That community engagement. Um, so at the end of last year, we uh, provided the uh, screening of the Black Panther documentary, Vanguard of the Revolution, which was amazing. Um, we also followed that up with a forum that looked at whether or not Brooklyn and Ferguson had connections. And that question was saying, is Brooklyn the next Ferguson? What were the conditions that were ripe for what happened in Ferguson after the shooting and killing of Mike Brown? Do some of those elements exist here in Brooklyn? And how can we, as black Brooklyners, um, really be a part of helping to shape what that looks like? Um, we followed that up with a really powerful forum in February, which looked at teaching black children, which again looked at educational equity. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our colleagues send children to private schools, charter schools, public schools. For us, it doesn't matter where your child is being educated, so long as that education is one that's going to speak to their specific learning needs as black children. Um, and then last month, in the honor of Women's History, month, we had the beauty of blackness and the law which was a dynamic. It was a full-day symposium. I'm still yeah. kind of exhausted behind it. Um, but it was a full day of panels and workshops that looked at the way the law has been used to restrict the way black women show up physically. So laws that are used to say how our hair can be worn to work and what's professional. And these laws are typically always coming from a framework that's outside of the black experience. And so, you know, I'll often, one of the things we did at, the, at that particular event was we had a picture of a young white girl with straight hair combed down, no barrettes. And we had a picture of a young African-American child with her hair combed out in an afro and we said is this do both of them represent combed hair and it was a struggle for the audience to recognize that black hair does not grow down so when we comb our hair it grows out yeah. and that they are the exact same hairstyle but they present differently because of the culture and the heritage of the person wearing it um, and so that was really powerful because what we see right now is a lot of women um, and men and young children actually being kicked out of school for having um, their hair styled in ways that are perfectly natural and acceptable mm -hmm. within the black community mm -hmm. women who are now being forced to choose between economic sustainability at work and making sure their hair will do something 
that it was never genetically designed to do. And, and as you said, with, with children, it you know I, I read some of the articles that people sort of share on Facebook, and we're talking literally yes, children, literally children, like fourth and fifth grade, yeah. right? Being and even you know a lot of times we think about these issues as it pertains to black girls, but there have been even reports of young black boys for showing up with a part in their hair that was considered too elaborate. And so when these decisions are being made by people who don't have an affinity with our community, when they're not culturally competent, not only is it telling the broader community that how we show up physically is fundamentally flawed, but it's also conveying to those within our community that there's something not quite right with us. And we really see the roots of that going back to the legacy of slavery. And so our work is to hopefully be able to challenge that in all of its manifestations, be that in the courtroom or in the public discourse, where we need to have these conversations amongst ourselves. Well, just looking at the depth and the breadth of just those forums. Yeah. yeah. If you guys didn't exist for 30 years, we'd certainly need to create you in the times that we're having now. <laughs> yeah. But I just wondered about that evolution when folks of Goodwill got together and actually founded and got a physical mm -hmm. plant and established some means and connectivity. What do you think about this current movements that we're yeah. seeing that are so decentralized and largely take place in the electronic sphere and how that is the evolution of the work started 30 years ago. Absolutely. I, I know that there is sometimes a tension between those two aspects of the community, but I actually see a lot of room for collaboration and really benefit for everyone. Yeah. I think when you can pair the wisdom of the elders who were a part of that initial thrust to get a place like the Center for Law and Social Justice established, and you match that up with the savvy and the technological advancement of the younger generation, um, you have really all the ingredients you need for a beautiful recipe, right? And so what I think our role would be, or our hope would be that there would be more space created for those two portions of the movement to come together to really continue elaborating and, and, and collaborating. And one of the, um, at the forum we had where Brooklyn, is Brooklyn the next Ferguson, we had members of Black Lives Matter, uh, Monica Dennis and Rakia Lumumba, um, women who are extraordinarily active in the current movement, who were really able to speak a lot to those issues. And what we're able to do with social media, you know, we all, we often say if Harriet Tubman had had <laughs> Yahoo Maps, right, if Frederick <laughs> Douglass had a library card, if any of these people right. had Siri. Yeah. What could we have done? And so I think that when we create room for collaboration, um, and I think you're seeing that a lot with the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm not a formal member of that organization, but I certainly support all of the work that they're doing. Um, and I think that you're seeing that when you have spaces where the leadership is able to be organic, where it is mm -hmm. um, not restricted by gender, not restricted by orientation, then you really have an explosion in capacity and the ability to really make um, a lot of ideas much more concrete and tangible. So I'm hopeful that there will continue to be even more more elaboration, uh, collaboration between those two elements of the movement. Well, frankly, it's one of the reasons why the center remains so relevant yeah. in the discourse. So I wonder, just from that perspective, where is the fight now, particularly as we look at this upcoming election? I think that the election itself, like the mechanics of the election, right? And so a lot of times, we, we as part of this movement now, um, there's the faction that says, I don't want to vote. None of these particular representatives are speaking for me. And so that's an active conversation that's being considered as a part of protest, and I, I have respect for that, and I see the value in that discourse. However, I think that this, again, is where some of the wisdom of other generations can come into play. Um, and so the idea that we need to be able to tie the concrete uh, power that is in the community to how it's voted into office, right? So a lot of people not aware that very key positions in our local electorate are voted positions. So the district attorney, you know, how does that impact what's happening on your community? Mm -hmm. Did you vote for that person? Do you agree with the way that cases are being tried in your area? Are you actively engaged when those campaigns are, are going on? And to the extent that right now we have a four election year in the state of New York. And, and so we have so many opportunities where people who have not been actively engaged in voting up until this point may find that they have been disenfranchised. There's been mm -hmm. recent purges, um, and there have been a number of folks who have found out, surprisingly, that they're not able to vote, um, even in this upcoming primary on April 19th, not which is critical. Trump Trump kids, yeah, exactly. Not just the Trump kids alone. <laughs> a <laughs> so, lot of surprises. Yeah. So. yeah. So I think that when you look at the work of places like the Center for Law and Social Justice, it's imperative that you have institutions that are able to speak to those issues and that are able to say, this is why the fighting for voting and for voting rights is not something archaic. It's not something that we could leave 
behind. It's very real, it's very prevalent, and it's very salient to what we're dealing with right now. We saw Selma. Well, absolutely. Uh, Make well, it happen. For people. all of the people yeah. that want to tune in now and may not be familiar, what are the next uh, community forums coming up? You also mentioned there's a gala later yes. in, in the year as well. Yes. And how can people get involved? So we are actually celebrating our 30th year, and in yes. September we're going to be having an, a gala event on September 23rd, and they're going to be Save the Dates heading out soon, so check your information. Okay, we'll be looking. Yes. We'll be looking. If you're not on the mailing list, please do go to clsj.org. That's our website. You can get signed up on our mailing list. We are going to have a number of uh, events targeted towards young attorneys coming up this spring and summer. I'm really wanting to make sure that the center is introduced to a new generation of legal minds and geniuses, and so we're hopeful that we'll be able to have a number of young uh, members of all the balsas if you're in the area. I, you know, NYU, hey, my uh, my <laughs> law school. Um, you know, so if whatever balsas you are a part of, if you are an active part of the law school community, we would invite you to um, join our mailing list. We have a number of events coming up, and we really want to continue maintaining strong linkages between the center and this new crop of legal experts. All right, mm -hmm. cool. Well, your work is cut out for you, and you are well to the task. <laughs> well, under Esmeralda's leadership, we are yeah. excited about Say it. Hi to her and Joan, and you get that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Appreciate it.